Hello, my name is Charles Upton, and uh, I'm producing a little series of videos which uh, are built around books. They're built around various themes, but each one is also a, a book review and essentially an ad for a book, some of which I wrote, some of which other people wrote. This is the one I'm doing now. It's a book called Who is the Earth? How to See God in the Natural World. And the name of this uh, video, as you've seen in the title, is... Uh, seeing through the earth and uh, when you say we see through something it has basically two different meanings one is seeing through something as if it were a window transparent the other is seeing through a deception the idea of seeing through the earth as a window is based on the traditional concept which you find in certainly in uh, the early church fathers and in Islam and in the Native Americans, and probably if you look hard enough in every religion, in every traditional culture, is that, uh, to use the, the terminology of, of uh, Islam based upon the Quran, that this world is an ensemble, a collection of signs of God, the signs of the different names, attributes, and qualities of God. That's what this world is. And every one of these signs, if understood, can be an avenue, a road, a path, directly back to its divine source in God. And uh, this is the way traditional human beings would look at the earth. Uh, and we can still do that today. It's harder, it's rarer, but it still can be done. The earth is still here while it's here, and we're still human, so we can do it. Uh, on the other hand, seeing through the earth in, in terms of a deception is uh, another meaning. And in, in, in terms of, of a deceptive quality, you know, um, we tend to, to accept what we see through our senses as a matter of fact. We don't see it as transparent. It's opaque to us. We take it as an object that, that is, is exactly as we see it and couldn't be anything else. And um, and the other aspect of that deception, because we've lost, or, an, and per, or progressively and very swiftly losing as a, as a race, the sense of eternity, we're starting to say, well, the earth, the earth will last forever. You know, to worship the earth as literal goddess, and you know, goddesses are immortal, they don't die. And uh, e even Christians are beginning to do this now. You know, I see in a recent Time magazine, you know, the earth it lasts forever, you know. <laughs> the earth lasts forever. Well, actually it doesn't. No religion says the earth lasts forever. And uh, certainly science doesn't believe the earth lasts forever. Science and religion who, who meet on so few uh, points, it seems, are, are unanimous on that point, obviously. We're in time. And in time, things begin and they, they end. So the idea of saying, well, the earth is a goddess and the earth lasts forever, this has to do simply with denial of our fear of environmental destruction. You know, we fear the end of the world. And so we create God knows what kind of fantasies. Well, the earth will last forever, you know. The earth, no, no, it won't. And we all really know this. You know, it could last hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of years or it could be gone in, in no time. But certainly it's not eternal. And yet through it, if we know how to see through it as a window, we can see eternity through it and by means of it. And strangely enough, what we, one of the things we see when we look through the earth as a window into the world of eternity, we see how another way the earth, as it were, has an immortal soul. Everything that passes in time is another way eternal in another dimension. It's because every moment is unique. And because every moment is unique, it's never repeated, and so it passes and is gone forever. But because every moment is unique, it's a manifestation of God who is the unique. It's one of the reverberations of his very uniqueness. Because he is, in truth, the only being. So, ah, uh, Excuse me, my cat is escaping. <laughs> Escape not. Yeah. 
She's a great cat. She really, she's had to be an indoor cat because we have a big road out here that squashes kitties. But she really knows the outside is out there, although she's never lived in it. And every day she gets there and looks out through a window at the natural world and sees the birds, you know, and sees the bunnies and says, oh, God, I wish I can get out there. You know, it's too bad we can't let her out, but we can't. So, um, Actually, the Zoroastrians have a concept of the earth, not as a goddess, but as a, one of the Amesha Spentas, which is something like an angel. And their idea of the earth uh, as an angel, is, it's as if the earth has an immortal soul. Well, the material earth, obviously, is going to begin and end. Everything material does. That's what matter is. It's very unstable, matter. It's the most unstable thing there is. Whereas, in another dimension, that is not this material earth. It's what the uh, Muslims call the earth of Urkaliya. Uh, this earth is eternal, just like everything else, just like every moment that passes. So um, I'm just going to give you a little example. You know, a, a lot of this is, is, is meditations of the kind that I've just given you. But uh, Here's something which um, actually is a practice that's embedded in this book. You know, this is the how-to part of it. It's called Listening to the Earth. The flow of the Tao, in Western terms, the will of God, comes into our experience through the dimension of time, which is why the ancient Chinese book on the wisdom of the Tao is called the Book of Changes, or I Ching. We become sensitive to the will of God by becoming intimate with time. And one of the best ways to do this is by listening. If we listen deeply enough, we can hear not only the, the changes of time moving through conditions, but the resonance of their eternal source, the logos, sounding behind them. So listening can be a form of contemplation. There are, say, four levels to this contemplation depending upon the depth to which and from which we listen. These are listening to the sounds of the world, listening to the inner sound in the brain center, listening with the heart center, and listening with one's whole being. In terms of the spiritual practice of reciting the, a name of God, which the Hindus call Japam, Sufis Zekr, and the Eastern Orthodox Christians, the Jesus prayer, or Mnimi Theu, remembering God. Listening to the sounds of the world corresponds to vocalizing the name, saying it out loud, or in the Hindu practice, hearing all sounds as mantra. Listening to the inner sound corresponds to the silent, the silent recitation of the name, saying it over and over again silently to yourself. Listening with the heart center to the experience of God speaking his own name within us. And listening with, with, with one's whole being to witnessing all events in the world or in ourselves as acts of God. In listening to the sounds of the world, you simply sit and attend to all the sounds within your range, birds, winds, wind in the trees, flowing water, traffic sounds, human voices, hearing them as the voice of the deity, the vibration of the primal creative source of the universe finally reaching your ears. As you wish, listen to the sounds of the world, you will realize that lapses in your attention correspond to obsessive sub-vocal speech. And the way to quiet this mechanical chatter is to listen to the inner sound in the brain center, that hum or hiss or high-pitched whine we usually hear when no sounds are coming in from the outside, the sound of silence. If the sounds of the world are like the leaves and branches of a tree, the inner sound is like the trunk. In listening with the heart center, you place your attention within your chest and, and attend to the soundless seed of your own being, the point where your body and mind are continually emanating from source, where God is eternally creating and recreating you, and the world around you, instant by instant. If the sounds of the world are like the leaves of the tree and the inner sound in the brain center like the trunk, then the soundless resonance of the heart center is like the root. And the heart center, at the heart center you are listening not to inner or outer sounds, but to subtle feeling tones that are also direct, immediate knowings. In listening with one's whole being, one totally surrenders to God, which entails the total annihilation of the listener. If listening to the sounds of the world it corresponds to the leaves of the tree, listening to the inner sound to the trunk, and listening with the heart center to the root, 
then listening with one's whole being is like the ground. Say these four levels of contemplative listening can be practiced separately, but the best way is to synthesize them, to simultaneously listen to the sounds of the world, the inner sound, and the resonance of the heart from the standpoint of the ground of being, thus demonstrating the Mahayana Buddhist doctrine that sansara is nirvana, or the Sufi teaching that the relative is the bridge to the real. And the best place to practice this absolute listening is in a wooded area during a gentle wind. So beyond that, I have, I'll just recite you the uh, chapter titles and then say goodbye. One, what is nature? Two, the other side. Three, the problems with nature worship. Four, the mother-child trap. Nature must save me. Five, work. Six, the beautiful and the sublime. Seven, humility. Eight, the virgin time. 9. The Nature Spirits 10. The Regime of Nature 11. Fall and Apocalypse 12. Technology and Sorcery, the Power Trap 13. Poetic Immortality, the Aesthetic Trap 14. The Terrestrial Paradise 15. Who is the Earth? 16. Christianity Unworldly, not Unearthly 17. Nature, Art and Alchemy 18. Contemplating nature as jnana yoga. 19. Nature as symbol. 20. Reality and name. 21. Listening to the earth. 22. Nostalgia and return. 23. We must save the earth. In quotes. And 14. Root and branch. Then I have a second part which is called Atlantis and Hyperborea, which is a whole other thing. So if you're interested in any of this, you can purchase this actual book. This actual object can be in your hands, not simply an image on the screen, but in your very hands. You can feel the weight of it. Okay.